Well, thank you very much. It's uh, an honor to be here. I want to express my appreciations to Grand Canyon University as well as AZ Business. Um, this is an honor and uh, very exciting to be able to have the opportunity to speak today a little bit about what we do at Cancer Treatment Centers of America, but also some of the incredible innovations that are happening in healthcare and for which Arizona ends up being the hub of some of those advancements in not just cancer care, but in healthcare in general. It's an extremely exciting time. Uh, I'll preface it by stating that we have so many unique resources in this state that end up allowing us to be at the spearhead for much of the development and advancements in healthcare and especially with regard to cancer care. And so I think we all should be very proud and enthusiastic for the future of healthcare in Arizona and the type of delivery of care that we can provide for our citizens within the state. Um, without further ado, uh, I always like to put this slide up there first because it really grounds me, if you will. Uh, reminds me of those things that are especially important. Very privileged to have had, uh, well, first of all, to have gotten Lisa to say yes 30 years ago was about the best thing that I'll ever do in my life. And uh, fortunate to have six beautiful children. Uh, learned a lot, obviously, from that kind of experience. Those of us that have the privilege of having families and children know how much we learn by seeing them grow and the experiences that come as, about, as a result of that. Uh, I am a professor. I've been a surgical professor, both a chairman of a department, as well as a program director for many years and learned great experiences from that. One of the aspects of being a teacher, and I don't have to tell those of you in this room that are teachers, that when you're in that kind of a position, it forces you to stay abreast of the most recent developments because you certainly don't want your students asking you something and you don't know the answer to it if you're a, a, the professor. Uh, very busy clinical surgeon. I was doing probably 400 major cases a year, which uh, afforded me the chance to be at the front lines and understand the difficulties of being a care provider as well as the privilege thereof. Um, a number of years ago, switched into the executive arena, more on the administrative side, and gradually made the switch to that being the majority of my activities. And I confess that initially there was some hesitancy on my part because I'd spent so many years training to become an active clinician, an active surgeon, and wondered what was that going to do if I was switching into the administrative side. And have recognized the privilege of being in the executive side is, is that I get to impact on many more patients as opposed to the single patient that I'm taking care of. You do lose some of the intimacy that comes on that one-on-one -on -one type relationship, which is why I've never entirely given up clinical care, and I don't intend to, at least if I have the ability to be able to practice. But without a doubt, the most significant learning experience that I had in my career was nine years ago when I got a call from my partner that, Ed, you know, Lisa and you probably ought to come into the office so that we can talk. Well, I'd had that same kind of phone call before, and so I knew what that meant. And I said, PK, obviously it's bad news. He goes, yeah, Ed, it's cancer. And it's a bad one. And it was. And in fact, to put it in perspective, the statistics, and uh, I'm very much a believer, as our organization is, is that no individual is a statistic. Unfortunately, it's either zero or 100%. But I knew, based on the statistics of large numbers of patients at that time, that my chances of being around five years later was 30%. Not very good. And I sat there looking at my then uh, little girl who was four years old and wondering if I was going to get to see her be five. And as you might imagine, those are tough emotions. And I can assure you, and I won't ask people to raise hands, but within this room there's a number of other cancer survivors. We certainly all know someone that has had cancer and probably no individuals that have passed as a result of it. It's an incredibly impactful disease, and it's one of the ones that perhaps is the most frustrating, because even though we know that there's not a whole lot you can do because of genetics and the like, perhaps with heart disease, hypertension and the like, maybe we had too many of those McDonald's fries, or maybe we didn't exercise quite as much as we could have. And that certainly impacts on a lot of the disease processes. When it comes to cancer, by and large, you don't have a lot of control. And it's one of the most significant problems with cancer is, is that it takes control away from the individual. And so one of the bases that I learned in my own personal experience is the importance of giving that control back to patients. 
I learned how much disparity was involved in cancer care. Now, you went through, I went through all the various experiences that I had as an executive, as a clinician, administrator, and the like. I was the director of a cancer institute, director of the cancer institute, institute for which I was diagnosed. And I thought, gosh, we're all about mind, body, and spirit. We're going to have complete and thorough care. And what I recognize is how many things we were not providing. We were doing an excellent job on state-of-the-art traditional care. Surgical procedure, uh, I had very advanced radiation therapy, a whole host of different aspects. But what I did not have good management on was nutritional support, pain management, rehabilitation, spiritual support, psychosocial support, and the like. Which as I've gone through my career, I've realized how integral that is to healthcare support and ultimately the success of the treatment therein. And so it was really with that in mind that I made some changes in my career plans and sought out an organization that focused on those kinds of entities, that recognized that it truly is an integration of that state-of-the-art traditional support and scientifically-based complementary support that allows optimization of those various traditional areas. So I learned that there's four key components to success in especially cancer care, but I believe it's really relevant to all aspects of care. And that is, is that you need to have experienced, compassionate, highly trained professionals. That sounds like a given, but it is key. And all of those are key. It's not just the fact that they've got a CV the size of a book, but they end up having that heart as part of it too. Second, you do need state-of-the-art technology. And to put it in perspective, it's been suggested that medicine is changing so rapidly that it doubles in knowledge every seven years. Well, if you end up having a practitioner that's going to practice 30 plus years, you can imagine if they are not very actively involved in continuing education, the care they're going to provide is going to be outdated. So state of the art, technology, and professionals that are keeping track of that technology. Third, scientifically based supportive complementary therapies, such as I mentioned, nutritional support, rehabilitation, pain management, psychosocial support, spiritual support, supplements, et cetera. All key to optimizing how effective that state-of-the-art traditional is. And they can't be disparate. You can't end up saying to someone, well, you know, you're kind of behind on your nutritional entity, and so there's a nutritionist that's up the street, and I think you probably can get in to see them, and here's their number, make an appointment, you go see that person maybe or maybe not in three weeks. That's really the state of the art in most healthcare entities. Those of you that have been patients know that's the case. And so it's clear that those all need to be really integrated so that you can optimize the approach to the patient. CTCA at Western was opened in December of 2008. I remember it very distinctly because it was one of those cold spells that we ended up having in December in Arizona and it was freezing. But nonetheless, that's when we opened. Uh, it, CTCA is a privately held uh, hospital system, cancer specialty hospital system. We have five hospitals in the United States and a very large ambulatory center in Seattle. Uh, we truly are a specialty designation hospital. Our patients travel over 500 miles and especially long distances here at Western because we end up having patients that come all the way from Canada and Mexico in addition to 13 states in the Western region including Alaska and Hawaii. So these patients end up being evidently courageous. Imagine the significant courage that it requires to make a decision to get on a plane, travel across the country, and go to a location where you don't know what it looks like, you don't know the people within that entity, you don't know where the stores are, et cetera, and you're leaving the comforts of hearth and home. It's one of the reasons why I so greatly admire patients that make that decision to travel and are so actively engaged in their own care. We started out with slightly under 150 employees, but to put in perspective the selectivity that we had for those 150 employees, we had 15,000 applications. We are very, very, very selective to those individuals that end up having the privilege of working at CTCA, and it's something that we would continue. For every person that's employed, it's roughly 100 applications, and for every person that's employed, it's roughly 15 interviews before we would hire someone. We have had very significant growth. As you'll note, in just that little over four year period of time, we're now approximately 600 employees and continue to have that kind of 20% approximate growth year over year. We're very attentive in our organization to mission, vision, values. Um, all organizations say that, 
The truth is, is that most organizations, as you well know, will end up having a mission, vision, values, and by and large, unless there's some kind of accreditation, review process, et cetera, it goes back in the drawer until that accreditation review is occurring again. We've taken a different tact, and I give credit to our leadership, especially our founder and chairman, for recognizing the importance, consistent with what I had as far as the first slide, my own personal foundation of my family and recognizing the importance of that experience, reviewing your mission, vision, and your values every single day. We never start out a shift without what we call alignment, where we end up having, at our place, it's called the Desert Daily, and each one of our hospitals end up having some kind of a statement sheet that comes out. And on that is the mission, vision, values, which we will review, and we'll also attend specifically to those values. And all of our stakeholders can recite them off the top of their head. We're hopeful, we're empowering, responsive, ethical, team-spirited, innovative, and compassionate. And the reason that all of us can do that, and the same thing with our vision and our promise, et cetera, is because we do think about those every day. And as we go through that particular list, we'll think about one particular value and give examples of being compassionate. One of our stakeholders that may have been compassionate in, in the care that they delivered. And then we'll discuss how you could be compassionate in what you're going to do the rest of that particular day. It's important in grounding individuals and reminds us of the culture that's going to be so critical to delivering that kind of health care. We're very clear about our mission. CTCA is the home of integrative, that's that combination of state-of-the-art traditional with scientifically based complementary care and compassionate cancer care. When I interviewed for my position, I did have a CV like a book. I'd been a chairman and associate dean and all that kind of stuff, written books and articles. And I remember being almost insulted because they wanted nine references. I thought, holy cow, you know, I took a shower. But the fact of the matter is, is that I recognized later on that what was important is, is that you weren't gonna get looked at unless you had those credentials. But did I have the heart? And in fact, what struck me the most is an expectation that was occurring on my interview was to interview and be observed doing so with two patients. And I remember the stories that those patients gave, and one of them brought me to tears. But it was actually that being more important to me being recruited as the chief medical officer at that time than the credentials, because they wouldn't have even interviewed me if I didn't have that. And so that's part of our mission and what we attend to every day. We never stop searching for and providing powerful and innovative therapies. You'll recall on those values, innovation is one of them. If medicine is in fact changing that rapidly, we have an obligation to be searching out and identifying those innovative therapies and providing that as an important and powerful option for our patients. To heal the whole person, improve quality of life, and restore hope. And each one of those components are very well thought of. That whole aspect of treating the whole person is that aspect of mind, body, and spirit, recognizing that it's not the pancreatic case in room 5101. It's Mrs. Smith, who is someone's mother and grandmother. Improve their quality of life. There's three things that patients pay attention to when it comes to cancer. Am I going to be cured? If I'm not going to be cured, can you delay the tumor's progression and or it coming back, so recurrence, and three, What's going to be my quality of life? If you're going to live longer, but they have a miserable quality of life, that's not so good. And so all three of those things are important. And lastly, hope. I believe with all my heart that if you end up having another one of those values, that being ethical, that there's no such thing as false hope. I believe that no one ends up having an expiration date stamped on their foot. And so when it comes to taking care of patients, and patients ask me, is there hope for me? The answer is an absolute yes. We have the fortune right now of being in a circumstance where healthcare is changing very rapidly and the options, especially in cancer, are changing so rapidly, and I'll talk about it in a few moments, that we can and we really should be providing hopeful options. Now that's not to say you give false hope. It is never appropriate to fib. That's just, just can't do that. But you can be fair and give information and tell patients the following. We have therapies today that we didn't have yesterday. And we're going to do everything we can because next year there'll be therapies that weren't there today. And patients have a right to understand the realities of that. We truly are a state-of-the-art facility. It was a little over 200,000 square feet. We're fortunate to be on 25 acres, and so we have lots of room to be able to expand. And, ex and in fact, our master plan 
through 2016 proposes up to 1 million square feet. And we really are on that kind of trajectory as far as growth. We just added on up to another 70,000 square feet to take care of some of the plant operations, transportation, et cetera. We've already expanded our laboratory and surgery areas with, with plans to expand that further. We just recently finished a 23,000 expansion on our clinic. Uh, this incoming year, uh, we're going to expand our inpatient units to take us up to 38 beds, the following year to another 45, as well as our infusion area. <laughs> I mention that not to talk about the growth, but to talk about how that growth occurs. That growth occurs with our patients front and center. We never do an expansion without consulting our patients. We end up having a group called Cancer Fighters, which really are ambassadors for us, but also advise us on how we're going to progress. I thought I had some great ideas as far as how we were gonna expand our gallery. And as I came in and as a CEO, I thought this is gonna be one of the first things that's gonna be my mark as a CEO. We're gonna change the way this gallery looks. And ended up talking to a small number of the, the patients and got some great ideas on color scheme and the decor and the furniture and everything else. And then took that to one of our numbers of focus groups and my boss, the COO, happened to be there that day. And we presented what we thought was wonderful and the patients shot it to whatever. As you might imagine, we changed the plans. But the point being is, is that that was a lesson both for me and the way we do things as an organization. That information all went back. We had much larger groups. They put forward some information on the various colors, the furniture, and things that frankly, I wasn't gonna think about. I had been a cancer patient, but I wasn't a cancer patient today. And so some of the things that ended up being relevant to the patients weren't front and center, even though I had that history and was a very experienced administrator. The patients chose colors that I wouldn't have chose. Well, now that it's up there, it looks absolutely gorgeous. It looks like you're walking into someone's family room and it is comforting and you don't feel like you're into a sterile environment of a hospital. That's the importance of focusing on the patients. We end up being the first all digital cancer hospital in the United States. We went up as a fully electronic hospital. It's very hard to find a printer around. <laughs> Our administrative area has one and it ends up being seldomly used because we end up keeping everything electronic. Now we didn't do that just so that I could get up here and make a statement of it being the first all digital hospital. We did that because of the importance of having that information all accessible so that we can retrieve that information in an organized manner and track how we're doing with an individual patient and with groups of patients so that we can get better with every single patient that we treat. We have 24 hour inpatient ICU capable rooms. Every single room, and it was the first hospital in the state to do that, can immediately be converted over to an ICU room. So you don't have to send someone down the hallway, which increases the risks of infection, problems as far as cardiac and the like when you're making those kinds of transitions. We end up trying to have an area which ends up being very comforting for the patients, a mini mall, if you will, with a spa and a salon and rehab areas with water uh, fountains and these kind of things all designed to try to calm the spirit of the patient and part of the healing process. We end up having skylight interactive system in the rooms. The patients don't have to get up to uh, request the nurse to change the temperature in the room. They can order food, videos, educational activities, whatever they want right from their bedside with a little portable keyboard, if you will, and even adjust the temperature and the light within their room. Uh, we end up having decentralized nursing stations. There's no nursing stations in the hospital. We end up having localized nursing areas right next to the room so that the patient is where they're supposed to be and that's front and center taking care of the patients. We end up putting in place a one million dollar filtration system so that every water, that bit of water that comes into our hospital is already filtered prior to going to our patients. We have very hard water in Arizona. There's certain predisposition to various organisms that can occur in that kind of an environment that like metals and the like. And so in a population of patients that end up being potentially immunocompromised because of chemotherapy and the various therapies that they're receiving, we're extremely attentive to making sure that we've covered that base. I talked about the whole concept of patient centrism, I mentioned alignment of what we do every single day. But it is key, even in an environment where you end up having electronic medical records and that level of communication, that you end up having the opportunity to elbow bump with your colleagues. And it's not just doc to doc or nurse to doc, but it's the entire continuum of care, both administration, allied health, supportive healthcare uh, positions, as well as nursing and physician staff. 
We have an entity called endorsement, which means three days a week, and we talk about all the patients that are within the hospital and those patients that are in outpatient care that are tough patients. And it may be that each patient's only talked about for two or three minutes, but they're talked about with the ability for everyone in that room, whatever their discipline is, to be able to make some contribution of, in, of information that they have gained. Maybe they talk to that individual's wife or their grandparent or their child to know something that's relevant to the care and can make a difference in providing that care to that patient. We talk about empowering patients. Patients are, uh, when I started out the talk, I talked about the fact that cancer takes control away from patients. It does. I was a surgeon. I was the one that was ordering the CT scans and telling patients, you need to come to my office, we're gonna talk about it, and we'll plan your surgery, et cetera. All of a sudden, I was the one being told cancel all your appointments, Ed, cancel your schedule, you need to be at the doctor's office and you're the one gonna be getting the CT scan, et cetera. And it goes beyond that. Cancer ends up being societal in terms of its impact, the cost implications on cancer, the implications as far as hospitals, the implications as far as staff, mental, all the components that have control that's taken away. The way to empower someone and the way to give control back is to give them information in terms they understand, and then empower them to be able to make decisions in their care. Because at the end of the day, it's what the patient values. It's, again, just like the decorations in our gallery. It's not what I value, it's what the patients value. Now it turns out that you can say, well gosh, they don't know enough about this. Then you've not really empowered them. You've not provided them information. It's not appropriate to walk in and say, don't worry, I fix. You're gonna be in the operating room in two days. The importance is to be able to give them information of what's broke, your recommendations, and then they can make decisions, and generally will make wise decisions when they're properly informed. That's an empowered patient. The other aspect of it is, is to put the patient at the center of everything that you do. If you end up recognizing that it's not about the doc, it's not about the administrator, it's not about the support staff, it's not about the employer or the patient, or the payer, it's about the patient, Everything else falls in place. I personally believe that one of the problems in the whole healthcare system is, is that we've got it backwards. We have forgotten that the patient is at the center. And we end up having a perverse healthcare system which ends up having payment and the various imports not consumer oriented. It needs to be based on the patient. The patients need to be in charge of that entire decision process. And it's so perverse that it impacts on the way we deliver care. For example, most healthcare systems end up being in tough circumstances right now. It's been stated that a third of the hospitals systems in this country right now are in the red. Well, if that's the case, how are you going to be able to do anything other than figure out a way to cut your expenses? If you cut your expenses, you cut the provision of various services. If you cut the provision of services, patients are gonna vote with their feet. They're not gonna come. And if they don't come, you're gonna further that problem because you're gonna have further decrease in your revenues, further problems as far as managing your expenses and it becomes a continual negative cycle. We believe that it needs to be the other way around. You need to find out what patients value and get the waste out of the system. I talked about our gallery. If you walk into our gallery, it ends up looking like a family room. It's beautiful, but it's not as expensive. We don't end up having you know, 15 story marble facades that cost a ton of money and frankly patients don't like. They're cold and they're intimidating looking and they cost a ton of money. And patients don't really want them. So you're putting money into things that the administrators think are really pretty and important and patients don't really appreciate it. We, we're very much into Lean Six Sigma and if you're into this particular entity you'll recognize a word called Muda which is waste. It's a Japanese word meaning waste. We do everything we can to get waste out of the system. Find out what patients value, focus on that, get waste out of the system, and what you can do is, is add programs. You can provide those things that patients value and they will vote positively with the, their feet. They will come, they will participate in care at that particular entity and it becomes a self-perpetuating positive phenomenon. I indicated that we're a destination provider, uh, uh, talked about that earlier. Uh, about half of our patients have received treatment elsewhere, and they've either failed that treatment or been dissatisfied with the care that they were being provided there, dissatisfaction scores. 
large percentage of our patients, if not the majority of our patients, end up being of advanced stage. That's particularly true, or was particularly true at Western, but as we have gotten more well known as a destination entity, and particularly locally, more patients are coming here immediately upon their diagnosis. So what we're finding is, is that we're seeing a higher percentage now of early stage patients, and that's exactly what's been the history of our other organizations. But our patients are sick. They come in with many what are called comorbidities. They may have pulmonary disease, cardiac disease, renal dysfunction, et cetera. So it's not enough for us to just provide very good cancer care. We need to have excellent care that addresses those needs, cardiac, pulmonary, kidney, and the like. So it really does need to be that full service care. And the other statistic is really important. 66% of our patients are malnourished. Now, a statistic from the National Cancer Institute in 2005 indicated that 40% of patients with cancer actually die of malnutrition rather than the cancer itself. Now, it's, it's a little bit of a misnomer in that it can be an indirect cause. The reason is, is that they may end up having blockage of their intestines so that they're not able to eat. But a considerable number of patients have an entity called cancer cachexia where they're just simply not wanting to eat and they get a wasting away, if you will. Why would you expect if somebody's malnourished and you give them a pain medication, or even more so, you give them something that's therapeutic, a therapeutic medication, that it's going to be properly metabolized? Tough subject, no one likes to think about it, but everybody in this room's probably had gastroenteritis at one time or another. How'd you like to take medications when you end up having that gastroenteritis? That's the way your gut's functioning when you're malnourished. Take the medication and it's inadequately absorbed or unpredictably absorbed, it may go right through you. So we'll find patients that need higher and higher doses of the pain medication, not because they're not able to, to properly metabolize it even if it did get in, but they can't even absorb it. And then even if they do properly absorb it, their liver, their kidneys, et cetera, are not properly metabolizing it. That's just for pain management. And I can tell you, I was there. I remember a couple days after my surgery, and I was having severe pain. I had a sarcoma in my leg, and I ended up requesting the nurse, you know, I need another pain medication. Now, mind you, I was the medical director of the Cancer Institute. I was the chief of surgical services. She worked for me. She says, I'm sorry, Dr. Stein, we can't, you're not due yet. Three and a half hours. I'm a doc. I could have written the orders, but I was a patient, so I couldn't do it. Okay. I said, call Dr. Chowdhury, you know, et cetera, tell him I need another pain medication. Well, she calls him and he's in the operating room, so he wasn't available. I said, call the residents, we're level one trauma, they're all busy. So I sat there getting progressively more and more in pain to a point where I was in tears. I'm a tough guy. And I remember thinking, this is nuts. I know there's no good physiologic reason why I can't have this pain medication other than some bureaucratic order but I can't do anything about it. Imagine the patient who doesn't understand that. They think there must be something wrong with me. I'm a weakling, I'm a wimp, I must have a problem. I better be quiet in the future because, geez, oh, Pete, these are smart people. They wouldn't not give me pain medication. They don't want to be mean to me. There must be something right that I shouldn't get the pain medication. What a terrible circumstance. So I understood the importance there of being able to be participatory in managing things like nutrition, pain management, rehabilitation, psychosocial support, spiritual support, et cetera, as an integral component of that care management for the patient. Because they often can't speak for themselves because we've not empowered them and give them information so that they can make those rational choices. talk about the whole CTCA experience, we end up having a website, cancercenter.com. It's actually the number one visited website of all hospitals in the country. One million unique visitors per day. And mind you, we only take care of cancer. So we're ahead of any of the other hospital systems, Mayo, MD Anderson, whatever. And I believe there's a reason for that. 24 hours 7, we end up having what's called OIS, which is our Oncology Information Specialists. If you end up going to our website, you can chat with someone 24-7. 365 days of the year. People that end up having a diagnosis of cancer at two o'clock in the morning, they're not sleeping. And they may want to talk to somebody. I can assure you, they are searching the internet for any bit of information they can get. And it turns out one of the things that we end up providing on that page is information. The majority of those patients obviously don't come to CTCA. 
And I actually view that with a great deal of pride, that we're providing information for individuals that may or may not be coming to CTCA. Now, of course, part of the reason for having it is, is the hope that they do. But the reason I have that pride is, is for those individuals that may not, but at 2 o'clock in the morning have a resource that they feel comfortable with going to be able to gain that information and, again, being empowered. We end up having, uh, I talked about our patient-empowered care model. It's a little bit unique. As opposed to the patient going to multiple different rooms to be able to go to the physician, go to the nurse, go to the nutritionist, go to our naturopathic physician, etc., we end up having rooms that are very carefully designed and very comfortable that the patients stay in for that entire series. So the way it works at our place is, Dr. Smith, Mrs. Jones will see you now, as opposed to the reverse. And we have it scheduled such that each of those particular appointments can occur back to back as opposed to it taking multiple days. All of that can be done within a couple few hours at the, with the comfort of the patient. We end up having workup guidelines. We call them CTCA workup guidelines. We follow various national guidelines, the National Cancer Consortium, and we've ctca eyes them, consistent with that type of a schedule, with our nutritional support, with our various other areas that are important. I mentioned the electronic health record and our integrative model as well as endorsement. We also have entities called care managers. We don't call them case managers. Because patients aren't cases, and what we're engaged in is care. And each patient ends up having two care managers that are permanently assigned to them. So that when they go back to Des Moines, Iowa, and it's 2 o'clock in the morning, they can call in and they're going to be able to talk to a voice that they recognize 24-7 if they end up having issues that occur while they're back home. The belief is, is that it's a care that never quits kind of a model, that once someone comes underneath our wing, that we're going to do everything we can to take care of those patients to treat them like we would family. Talked about innovation, and I put up just a few of these here, uh, and I want to put in perspective. One of the things that I had to focus on during my career was breast care, and was very much involved in that, and lots of publications and research and so forth. But it turns out that today, less than 50% of the care that I would provide in breast care did I learn in my fellowship. That's how much it's changed. And I can go through slews of different examples of things that just weren't even around. MRIs, various vascular-related ultrasound, percutaneous biopsies, stereotactic biopsies, ultrasound-guided biopsies, et cetera, et cetera, that weren't in place. So the key is, is to be able to be on top of those new and innovative developments so that we can provide that care to our patients. One of the things that I'm the most excited about, and it really is, is one, a message that I would give, not just for oncology, but for all of us in this room to talk about as far as being enthusiastic and privileged to be alive today. And that is the whole concept of molecular medicine. You may or may not be aware that the human genome was just defined 10 years ago. The human genome is what tells us whether or not we're going to have blue eyes, brown eyes, red hair, blonde hair, tall, short, etc. And there's an enormous amount of information there. It's absolutely fascinating how much information. To put in perspective how much information it is, each human genome ends up being such that if you took a single page of text and you had letters all the way across that single page of text, take a thousand pages of that and now a thousand of those thousand page books. So nothing but text all the way across, no spaces, no nothing of letters. Thousand pages of that and a thousand books like that. That's what's contained in one person's human genome. You can imagine how tough it is to be able to store that kind of information. It's really a revolutionary change. But because of bioinformatics and because of the advances that we have in technology being so rapid in their ability to be able to assess that, the cost has come down dramatically to be able to do those assessments and the information that's provided is enormous. Among all of that, each of us have roughly 23,000 genes that tell us about those blue eyes, brown eyes, brown hair, et cetera kind of stuff. And a number of those genes are relevant to cancer and can give information that is predictive on how a cancer is going to behave. Put it in perspective, if each of, it, if, of us in this room, God forbid, ended up having a diagnosis of lung cancer, the odds are that most of us, if not all of us, would get the same cocktail of chemotherapies. Well, look around the room. We don't look anything alike. We know we're different. Again, blue eyes, brown eyes, blonde hair, tall, short, etc. 
why would it make any sense since we're so different and we can look at each other and tell that, that if we had lung cancer that each of us would get the same cocktail of chemotherapy? That's the craziness of medicine historically. But it's because of the gross and limited assessment technologies that we've had. Here to four, the technologies kind of, what does it look like under the microscope? Okay, that's lung cancer. And is it a small lung cancer or a big lung cancer? Are there lymph nodes involved or not? That's about it. That's about how rudimentary we separated cancers. What's happened today is, is that huge amount of information has allowed us to look at distinct differences molecularly between the different cancers and not only get information from prognosis, but now it's translating into therapy. We can take that information on size of tumor, lymph nodes or not, and give some information on prognosis. Good prognosis, bad prognosis. I talked about the fact that we have a large number of patients that come in with advanced stage. Well, it's based on those kind of limited factors. But imagine how sophisticated it is if you take that human genome and you use differences, unique differences, to be able to predict how a tumor is going to be able to behave. If you had a tumor that was overwhelmingly likely to be cured just with surgery, would you want to have chemotherapy? Not me. And if we can get to a point where we're sophisticated enough to make those kinds of predictions, which we're getting to be able to do, we can avoid unnecessary therapies in patients and be more specific with therapies that are appropriate for other patients. That's what's occurring now with this whole concept of molecular and what's called precision medicine. It's genomics, epigenomics, proteomics, and a whole host of fancy names that's the result of very advanced technology and the combination of the availability of high-speed, reliable computers and bioinformatics. We are uniquely positioned here in Arizona to be leaders in that field. We end up having strong universities, and we're at one of them that end up providing research and educational opportunities in those areas. We have remarkable bioinformatics capabilities in this state. We have tremendous vendors in the scientific arena. TGen is just one example, an important one, that ends up being at the forefront of these particular areas. And what it's allowing us to do is to move into very specific treatments. During the, my career, there were roughly 40 different chemotherapies available for that 30, 40 years. That's it. We got better as far as our therapies by altering the doses, by doing different kinds of administration. As we speak today, there's 200 different targeted therapies going through the FDA pipeline. So you remember when I started out my talk about those hopeful options of saying what we have available today will be very different than what we have available tomorrow. And it truly is a hopeful opportunity that we can provide to our patients as a result of that kind of advancement in technology. We end up having newer delivery systems the capability of being able to administer chemotherapy into areas that you otherwise wouldn't have been able to do just in years past, to do surgery within the abdomen and actually place catheters into the abdomen and give chemotherapy directly to the tumor right within the abdomen all in one procedure, which has shown amazing results in patients that otherwise really, really not had a therapeutic option in the past. Major resections because of our advancements in intensive care, anesthesia, nutrition and the like, the mortality from these very major resections ends up continuing to come on down. It provides options for patients that, again, just 10, certainly 20 years ago, would have been told, we really have nothing that we can offer for you. Even the context of four-dimensional radiation therapy. I had radiation therapy myself. It was just nine years ago. And ended up, because of the damage to tissues adjacent to it, ended up having damage to the bone, such that I ended up getting a very bad fracture. So I've got metal in there so that I end up going off like a bell when I go through the airport. That having been said, that's not likely to occur in today's environment because of some of the advances in technology. Very focused, computer-guided imagery, and even temporally related, such that there's time associated so that you can adjust where the radiation beam occurs based on things like breathing cycle and the like. Those kinds of advancements are, are nothing short of remarkable, and I certainly wish they were available 10 years ago. Interoperative radiation therapy. We performed the first interoperative radiation therapy of the breast here a little over two months ago, and now have done five such procedures, allowing a patient at the time of the operation, the resection of their cancer, to receive their radiation at the same time. 
Think of how amazing that is, opposed to going on for six weeks of radiation therapy afterwards. To have a significant portion, if not all, of your radiation done right at the time of the operation, intraoperatively, without the damage to the, to the associated skin and the like. Huge advances in technology. Why is innovation important? We all know innovation ends up being important. It's critically important in healthcare. Improved processes, patient safety, differentiators as far as an organization, reputation and the like. But perhaps most important, circling back to the patient and what they value is enhanced patient loyalty. It becomes that positive cycle. I talked about the fact that we're very attentive to the process component of it. And I don't want to underestimate the process component of innovation. One of the things that occurs is that process Im improvement, process innovation, is maybe as or more impactful than some of the technical advances. There's lots of technology around, but if you don't optimize the process associated with it, you'll never see the maximum results. We're very careful about utilizing our electronic health record to be able to track those kinds of results. One of the most significant technology advancements in recent years is the true electronic health record. And there's still lots of hospitals that haven't fully adapted electronic health records. They may have parts of it, but may not be fully electronic. And I talked about why we end up having them. But one of the points I'd like to make in this talk is what I believe to be the most significant innovative advancements that can occur, and not just in health care, but can occur in any entity. And that's the combination of process enhancement with technology advancement. And here's a great example of it. When we went to electronic health records from paper records, we saw a decrease in our number of medication errors and we saw a decrease in the variability. So it was more consistent results and a decrease in errors, just going from paper records to electronic health records. But when we then added barcoding, which is a really simple technology, my goodness, we use it in the grocery stores. But it's a tough process. If you're in a hospital, just think about it in the operating room. You've got everybody sterile. How do you barcode? How do you stand there and barcode the various supplies that are coming in if everybody's sterile? So you have to be very attentive to the process. But by optimizing that process and developing techniques to be able to do barcoding, we further decreased our medication errors and further decreased the variability than we did with just the electronic health record technology. So process innovation plus technology innovation results in true transformational change. In fact, we've gone several months in a row with zero medication errors. That's where I want to get treated. How do we know if we're making a difference? We do so by measuring everything. We're very careful about utilizing the electronic health record to track our results, and we end up comparing ourselves to our hospitals as well as outside organizations. And I can assure you that we're very competitive with our sister hospitals. If someone else identifies an entity that's allowing them to get that result done faster, I can assure you, I'm either texting or on the phone to figure out how they're doing it, because I know at the next board meeting I'm gonna be asked why I don't have that result in the best interest of the patients to do so. And we're very transparent about it. One of the keys ends up being transparency of your results. Don't shoot the messenger. Encourage the messenger to bring the information forward so that you know what the data is and you can improve on it if you have that opportunity. If you're not transparent about results, you're not going to be able to facilitate improvement. So if you go to our website, you'll see survival information, recurrence information, and quality of life information on the 10 most common cancers that we treat. And here's just the type of thing that you'll see if you go to the website. So any consumer, patient, can make a value-driven decision, an educated, empowered decision, by going to the website and deciding, is that a place where I want to be treated? Same thing in terms of quality of life. Remember, I talked to you about three things that are important. Survival, recurrence, quality of life. And what that results in is patient satisfaction scores that are the highest in the industry. We end up regularly having patient satisfaction scores that are well over 90%, whereas most industry satisfaction scores that you'll see run about 50-55%. And the reason we do so goes back to the founding of the company. Our company was founded by an entrepreneurial individual whose mother had bladder cancer, and she died of bladder cancer. She was not empowered. She wasn't given all of the options. And ultimately her cancer advanced and the family was devastated. 
and he made a commitment that he was going to identify a hospital system that provided cancer care that did in fact empower patients, that was very attentive, attentive to the foundations of mission, vision, values, attentive to that integrative model, and at its center placed the patients and treated them like they would someone's mother, father, brother, sister. I tell new stakeholders it's hard to be a CTCA stakeholder. It's hard not because of just the expectations, but it's hard because if you embrace that real concept and you treat every patient like you would your mother, father, brother, sister, you can't help but sometimes get disappointed because not everyone's going to be cured. On the other side of the coin, the privilege that we end up having in sharing of the successes and the intimacy that develops in that kind of a patient relationship when patients do do well, as measured by things they value, is incalculable. And so we feel very privileged to be able to have that opportunity to provide that kind of a mother standard of care. And with that, I'll finish and be happy to entertain any questions. I have a friend who lives in Scottsdale, and she has a number of issues. I'm not a medical person, so I have no clue. Is it possible to take her to your place so she can see? I mean, do you give this, does someone give this kind of seminar? We do, and we give, uh, actually, we're very open to tours regularly. Um, in fact, I see a number of familiar faces, and I'm sure people in this room could tell you that they've had tours of our facility. Uh, to learn more about it and to hear the same kind of things that I talked about today and see the various areas that we deliver care as well. We do that every day. Right. I'd be happy to give you my card and uh, please feel free to call me. Yes. Who do you use for your molecular profiling? Do you use Keras? Uh, no. Um, actually, part of the reason for that has been a very rapid evolution. Right now we're using an entity called Foundation One. Um, we are partnered with Tegen as well. Uh, Keras ends up being a small, well, just real briefly, and I'm not going to get hugely technically oriented on, but just suffice to say that most everybody in the room has heard of things like estrogen and progesterone receptors, as an example, and I see lots of heads nodding. There are certain individual markers that are important to make determinations on how you treat certain cancers. And there's a number that have now been very well recognized, and probably everybody in the room knows the story of Angelina Jolie, and recently she ended up having a marker, BRCA, which gave a high prediction for her developing breast cancer during the course of her life. In fact, very specific information, 83% if she lived to be 82. That's how predictive you can get with that kind of mutational information. But that's one single marker. And there are certain small panel groups. Oncotype DX is one, has 21 genes. Keras ends up being a type that has a limited panel of markers. Foundation One ends up right now being 236 markers, and it's growing. Six months ago, it was 180. And they're located out of Boston. Now, there are a number of vendors like that. Foundation One's one of them. We've uh, been utilizing those as a primacy for our larger panel. But what I believe is going to happen in fairly short order is, is that whole gene sequencing will be where we go. Rather than taking an isolated panel, 236 genes, remember I mentioned there's 23,000 of them? Well, it's getting to a point where the cost is no longer prohibitive to give that information. And as more patients end up having genes sequenced, it's almost like artificial intelligence. The more patients that have that information, the smarter we get on knowing how to treat. Well, if the cost comes down and you can get whole gene sequence information for a cost that's the same as getting that small panel, I think it's going to be market driven so that there's going to be a preference for whole gene sequencing. I don't think we're too far. Well, right now, it's the cost of a CT scan, basically. So it, it really is a, an exciting and brave new age, but there's a lot of issues. What do you do with all the information that there may be a mutation? We don't know what the significance is yet. Who keeps track of all that information? What are the issues in terms of intercommunication of you live in Poughkeepsie and got a whole gene sequence and now it's five years later and you end up having a tumor and it's a different gene sequence? Who keeps track of that? So there's a whole host of societal, political, financial, governmental issues that end up being relevant to this concept of molecular medicine. But I'm one that views that with a glass half full kind of an attitude. And I think the, the implications for improved health care for all of us are so significant, we have no choice. We have to get this one right. Yes? 
Do you take all patients who come to you, or how do you do that? We, we have various insurance contracts that we take. Um, actually, we end up having potential contracts with 100 million people within the United States population, so there's a large number of patients, but not all patients. Uh, there are some differences between our different sites as far as the contracts. For example, Illinois ends up having a Blue Cross contract. Um, our site in Georgia also has a Blue Cross contract. We're fairly new, and so there's some ongoing discussions right now. Uh, with that particular payer, we do have Cigna. We have others as well. But the answer is no, we don't take all patients. But if you go to the website, it actually it lists like this the various insurers that we do take. But those who are approved insurance-wise, do you have the space? I mean, yes. I imagine you have We do. Of we're busy, but we end up, uh, it's part of the reason why we're growing. Yeah, we have, we do have capacity. We're trying very hard to make sure that we're ahead of that kind of growth. As I said, that we end up having 20 plus percent growth year over year. And so it's part of the reason. It's a good news from the standpoint of the state as far as jobs and revenue for the state. It's tough news for the, the fact that there's that many people with cancer that have trouble. For someone who's pretty healthy, which I am, but you know, cancer, it seems like it's in everybody's family, which is scary. Yeah. Do you have like an online form that you can fill out that maybe you might be predisposed to it besides the testing when you don't really go to the doctor? It's a great question. We're, we're not a screening organization yet. There is some discussion along those lines. And in fact, uh, I was talking to Michael before. Um, CTCA, as of July 1st, uh, has a new entity called uh, CTCA Medicine and Science, which is essentially all of the clinical operations across the organization that I'll be heading. Um, and it ends up having as a primary focus of it this whole concept of precision medicine. And some of the aspects therein is, is how much is appropriate for screening and the like. We are, after all, cancer treatment centers of America, but that implies diagnostics and the like as well. Remember, the single biggest risk factor for the development of cancer is a previous history of cancer. To take all does it factors. enjoy like your immediate family or just father, you, mother? You. If you end up, if you look at all the risk factors, and there's lots of them, you know, let's, let's just take, for example, lung cancer, smoking, there's a risk factor. But if you take all different risk factors for just the development of any cancer, the single biggest risk factor for the development of another cancer is a previous history of cancer, for whatever reason. And I suspect that that goes to the fact of various genetic predispositions that allowed you to develop a cancer in the first place would suggest that there's probably other genetic predispositions for cancer as well. In the back, yeah. You spoke about the advancements in economics and Yes, sir. The region that Arizona plays, or uh, because what role does a university like ours have in the future to play that out? Well, if you just subdivide it, you can think of the various diagnostic aspects, and you've seen the the amazing evolution that's occurred in just ten years. Remember, ten years ago, it was a full one-year process, computers that basically filled up a room uh, at a cost of one billion dollars. Today, you're talking under $20,000 can be done in 48 hours with an entity that's certainly smaller than this little machine right here. And so that's part of the diagnostic areas. But we also don't know how much we don't know. So identification of genes and what those applications might be in cooperation with healthcare entities. Um, we're a care provider, but we don't have the research side. And so those, uh, from an analysis standpoint, from a tracking standpoint, re reagents and process improvement, SOPs that might end up improving that overall process, just in the diagnostic side. And then the next phase of it is, is really the information management. It's one thing, and it really is a, don't have a blackboard, but here's a great way to think about it, and, and I'm giving this, and you sound like you know a fair amount about this, but imagine that you end up having just four letters, four alphabet letters, and those letters just kind of are intermittently repeating across that page. And you end up having those thousand pages of those letters. Now think of that almost like a crossword puzzle. You could go through and, and if you really are knowledgeable on the various genes, you may be able to separate and you see five letters in a row, okay, that's a word, and then there's gobbledygook letters, and now you've got another word, and then there's a little bit more gobbledygook, the fancy name is introns, 
and then you've got another word, and you get those group of words together, and that forms a sentence, if you will, just like crosswords, and that sentence is one gene. Well, if there's 23,000 genes in that million pages of information, you can imagine the sophistication of the computers that have to be able to get that information. And now you've got the information, and now you've got mutations or changes on those 23,000 genes. What does that mean? So it requires analysis. You can see where universities and the background that they end up having in all of those particular areas are essential to our going forward on this. Yes, sir. Uh, similar to me in the beginning of your presentation, uh, you used the word spiritual. Uh, or did I yes, misunderstand sir. that? Yeah, well, spiritual being, yeah, um, higher being. And uh, I end up being one that, that has a strong faith. And uh, it certainly was important to my recovery. And people have different beliefs. And there's tremendous amounts of objective studies out there that show the importance in recovery on supporting spiritualism in the components of therapy for patients. And the data is really compelling, especially in the cancer arena, but not just in cancer as far as the importance. One of the things that's fascinating to me is that two individuals that were very much involved in the human genome, one of whom here is in town, the president of TGen, Jeff Trent, and his associate, Francis Collins, the current director of the National Cancer Institute, are two individuals that are very, very strong spiritual individuals and have written books along those lines. Now, these are some of the most scientifically deep individuals in the country. Now, I wouldn't, you know, suppose to get up here and and get on a platform stating belief or not one way or the other. I'm very respectful of the different beliefs. But I also would state the importance of recognizing that as an important component of therapy should patients be desirous of that component. We have time for one more question. Yes, ma'am. Please talk about, um, about how your, you know, your cancer um, impacted your life. How, I mean, professionally, and yeah. you know, how did that impact your life? personally and professionally to be able to do what you do? You know, in, in life, uh, there's a poem by Elaine Maxwell that uh, essentially suggests that you can control your destiny. I used to carry that with me. I now realize that that was very wrong. You partially control your destiny. Um, and I think that, you know, it's sort of like the, the Yogi Berra, you know, when you come to a fork in the road, take it kind of an approach. Um, I view that cancer experience for me as, as that fork in the road. And it created a requirement for me to be introspective and reflective of those experiences and how that impacted. And what some of the rules were that I thought were fact and in fact were absolutely incorrect. And I felt very privileged to have the education and background that I have and the hopefulness of being alive and to be able to use that education and training um, and now experience to be able to change the way I delivered and helped to deliver care. So I believe with all my heart it was one of those personal tragedies that turned into a personal blessing. Well, I'd like to thank Dr. Stern for being here today. And I also would really like to thank Grand Canyon U University for continuing to be our partner on this uh, lecture series as part of the CEO series. So we'll see you next time. Thank you for coming.